for the uh, introduction and uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me along here to speak today and thanks again for coming along to listen uh, to my talk. So um, as we just heard, my name is Ian Kemp. I'm, I work at the uh, International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, which is a joint venture between Curtin University and the University of Western Australia. And uh, I guess the core funding for this enterprise comes from the government of Western Australia. So we're, we're thankful there. And um, I'm hoping that during this talk you'll um, understand why the, Western, why the government of Western Australia is interested in promoting, um, re promoting radio astronomy um, in the state here. And I'm really kind of hoping that um, at the end of this talk you're going to say, wow. You know, we want to, I want you to say, wow, because I'm basically going to talk about the um, Square Kilometre Array, which is a, a major science project that's um, just starting up in Western Australia. And to, to explain why the SKA is so wow, I need to start initially by telling you a little bit about the current state of astronomy. So what is, what is astronomy? What is radio astronomy? What's it about? What are we doing? And then when you've, when you've heard that... I'm going to explain to you what the SKA is all about. And that's what I want you to say, wow, that's just fantastic. Because you'll be very impressed with um, uh, how, how big the project it is and how much it's going to extend our knowledge of, um, of radio astronomy. And it's happening right here in Western Australia. <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, I guess a question I get asked quite often is why astronomy? You know, why do people... Why do people study astronomy, and why do why do adults kind of de de dedicate their um, lives to studying astronomy? I mean, you know, what's it about? So, uh, to me, I mean, to me personally, it's really about going back to those questions that I had when I was eight or ten years old. You know, like, um, what's the universe made of? You know, hey, mum, you know, where does the world come from, and uh, who made it, and where is it going, and what what's, what's everything made of, and you know, all those, those big questions, you know. So um, I, I, I'm still interested in those questions. And even though I got distracted f for 40 years or so by the requirements of um, having to buy a house, bring up a family, having to follow a career and that kind of stuff, when it comes back to it, I still, I'm still interested in those basic fundamental questions about what is the universe, where did it come from, where is it going. Um, <clears throat> so I've decided to spend my my work hours, as it were, um, studying the area. And, I was, and I'm sure that most other um, professional researchers in science are motivated by the same basic uh, childlike curiosity. To just, we just want to know why things are the way they are, you know, and where did they come from? Now, what we've, what we've discovered over the last, um, the last couple of hundred years or so is that one of the best ways to get answers to questions like these is the scientific process. And I've tried to represent that by this little um, green arrow diagram thing on the right here. So <clears throat> we basically start off with an idea, theory, you know, and ideas. Are, ideas are cheap, right? So anybody can come up with an idea. Um, you just put two scientists in a pub with a pint of beer each, and they will come up with all sorts of kinds of ideas, right? Where science is a little bit different is that we just we take those ideas and we use them to say, right, we're going to go off and make some observations. So we're going to go out and we're going to look at stuff that's actually occurring in nature um, and see um, how it behaves um, as predicted by our theory. And from those observations, we make uh, data, we turn it into numbers, diagrams, and then we come back with those numbers and diagrams and say, how well did that fit our theory? And if it doesn't, if the data doesn't support the theory, we throw it away. It doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how great the theory is, if the data don't support it, uh, the theory is no good, we get rid of it. If, on the other hand, the data kind of does support the theory or partially supports the theory, then we go, oh, we're onto something here, and let's come up with a slightly modified version of the theory that can give us a better prediction of the observations. And then we go off and make some more observations, more, more data. <clears throat> we go around around the circle. And this is uh, this has been, over the last few hundred years, this, this process has been developed quite highly and has been really, um, really developed to show this is the best way for us to answer 
um, questions about um, about nature and about the, the universe and the way things really are. <clears throat> so that's my that's my answer to that question. Why astronomy? Now, if you're going to okay, so given that we're going to study astronomy, why study radio astronomy? What is so special about radio astronomy? And if, I'll show you this slide here, which you might remember if you. Um, from high school <laughs> or university, you know, whatever back in time there, you know, you've, you may remember this thing which is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's showing you the relationship between um, electro electromagnetic radiation all the way from gamma rays and x-rays through the visible range right down to radio down there. These, these, this radiation all has kind of similarities to it. <coughs> um, it's mainly the differences are mainly just due to the the wavelength of the of the radiation. So this bit in the middle here, this 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 visible visible light, um, well, this has been the basis of optical astronomy and uh, you know using using your eyes and using telescopes. So optical astronomy has a long history going back hundreds of years, and you know, people have been looking at the sky with telescopes um, since the 1600s. You know, but they've only been able to see um, radiation in that very small part of the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum. And whereas radio radio telescopes down here, they can see um, a much bigger part of the spectrum. And there's lots of Lots of physical processes that go on in outer space and to do with stars and the galaxies and stuff, which give off radiation in the radio range, but they don't give out radiation in the optical range. So there are many things happening in space that we can study with radio waves that are kind of new and they've never and they've never been observed over the hundreds of years of using uh, optical astronomy with with traditional kind of telescopes. I'll give you one example of that. So here's a, um, here's a galaxy. So when, when, if you go out and look up into the night sky, um, you'll see stars, right? So most people think of astronomy as being about looking at stars. Um, now, stars don't just float around on their own in space. Stars live in large uh, collections called galaxies. And what I'm showing here is a... Uh, a type of galaxy is called a spiral galaxy. And if you look at it face on like this, you've got this bright uh, spot in the center, and you've got these lovely spiral shaped arms radiant coming out from the center. The overall th the thing overall has got a circular shape. And if you look at it sideways on, it's very, very flat, like a very thin, um, a very thin kind of uh, disc shape, maybe with a bit of bulge in the middle there, but um, it's basically a thin disc with these spirals sort of painted on the front of it, you know. And our, our galaxy, the, the galaxy that our sun and our planet are in, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy like this one, and we're kind of part way out from the centre to the edge. So if you look up in the night sky, um, if, you, if, you can get, if you can get like 100 kilometres away from the city centre in Perth, if you get out into the country a little bit, um, at the right time of year you'll see the Milky Way. And this is... Uh, it's the Milky Way, and this is what, what's happening here. Is you're looking towards the centre of the galaxy, um, and you're seeing it side on, right? So you're seeing it as a, you're seeing this thin layer of um, stars there. Now there's quite a lot going on in this picture here. There's like a few different things. So first thing you see is the Milky Way like that, right? Now the stars are too far away for you to for you to see them as individual stars. You just see a white kind of milky substance which is consists of millions of stars all in close proximity to each other. The very centre of the galaxy through here you can't see because um, it's blocked out by dust lanes. So there's, uh, there's in, in the disk of the galaxy there's dust of dark material which blocks some of the light from the centre of the galaxy. So with an optical telescope you can't see what's going on at the centre of the galaxy there. <clears throat> the other thing you can see in here is um, if you look at the back, if you look at this part of the, this part of the picture up here, lots of individual little white spots. You see now these little white dots, they are of course stars, right? Now these stars are so close that we can resolve them as individual points. So these are foreground stars that are very close to us. You know? These are a lot closer to us than what the uh, the, the galaxy 
galactic center is. So you've got the stars in the foreground, you've got the galaxy in the background, and um, I don't know whether you can see it on this display. You can see it perfectly on my Mac, uh, my high quality <laughs> Mac display, but I don't know if you can see it there. Going right across here, there's a straight line um, of light radiation going right across the picture down there. Right? Now this this photo, because it's showing the Milky, Milky Way, they've obviously involved it's obviously involved in an exposure of twenty to thirty seconds or so exposure of the camera. And during that 20, 20 to 30 seconds, a satellite has shot straight through the image and has left its mark right across the picture. And that's absolutely typical. Anyone trying to do optical astronomy these days, or even radio astronomy as well, you're trying to take, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to collect data about the, of the um, external cosmos and your view is being constantly disrupted by satellites flying across the, in the foreground. <coughs> I'll just leave that one there. Now, if we go and look at the centre of the galaxy using a radio telescope, like this one here, the picture is completely different. So this is the centre of the galaxy um, imaged using um, the Murchison Widefield Array, which is a radio telescope in Western Australia. And what we see here, firstly, is you get a continuous kind of flat um, edge-on disk here. Uh, that's giving off radio radiation, and this is not this is not caused by stars, right? So stars don't actually produce a lot of radio radiation. What we're seeing here is radio that's being given off by hot gas, mostly mostly hydrogen gas, which sits in the galaxy. So so the galaxy contains a lot of stars, but also contains a lot of gas, which fills up the spaces in between the stars. And with a radio telescope, we're seeing the gas in between the stars. Um, and you notice in the background here you've got these, uh, oh sorry, so the, the other thing I mentioned is that, that dust, those dust lanes that block us from seeing the centre of the galaxy, they don't stop radio waves. So radio waves go straight through the dust and we can still see them. So, so with, a, with a radio telescope we can see right through to the, the centre of the galaxy here, no, no dust lanes. And up here, away from the main part of the image, you're seeing these a whole host of white dots again. You know, so these white dots, um, you might think those are stars, but as I already told you, stars don't give off very much radio radiation. And these, in fact, are individual galaxies. So every every one of these little white dots up here is a separate galaxy that's in the background of the image. And they're, they're in distant, distant um, space, which is why they just show up as points rather than... In, rather than galaxies with a big shape to them. So a little bit like the optical one, we've got stars in the foreground, or well, here we've got individual galaxies in the background. So this, so the, the Milky Way is the close thing, and these are distant individual galaxies, thousands and thousands of galaxies, and each, every galaxy, of course, contains hundreds of thousands of stars. So you, know, you can start to get an idea about how big the universe is when you look with a radio telescope. And up here is another thing, is a thing called uh, Centaurus A that we might uh, might talk about. It's, a, it's one, in, one individual feature which you can see with a radio telescope that's basically invisible with, uh, with, with optical telescopy. Now if we, if we go down to the centre of the galaxy here, we'll look, we'll look, look a little bit closer, what can we see? Well, you see a lot of that bright radiation along the centre there. Um, actually, it's not uniform, it actually consists of these little bubble shapes here, little round shapes. And there's one that's off the centre, and there's a there's a really big one here that's close to us, maybe. And there's another one there, which you can see. And what these actually are is these are the um, remnants of old stars that have, that have ended their lives and exploded. So a large star um, is powered by nuclear fusion caused by hydrogen hydrogen fusion at the centre of the star and that's what generates the heat that keeps the star keeps the star up. Now when it gets when it gets towards the end of its life it runs out of hydrogen and the fusion reaction stops. What happens at that point is that the star will collapse. So the um, all the mass of the star comes, starts to fall in towards the centre. As it reaches the centre it becomes extremely hot 
and you end up with this massive hot collection of uh, matter in a very small space and it undergoes a thermonuclear explosion. So that's the same as the same as a um, hydrogen bomb <laughs> exploding, but billions of billions of times bigger than anything that we puny humans could ever do. So, so the the star initially falls in on itself, then there's a tremendous explosion, and it blows its material out in the form of these circular shells, shells of um, gas and dust and heavy elements spreading off out into space uh, to fill space up with the heavy elements there. And eventually those will be ca maybe captured by other stars and uh, fall in under gravity and they can, they can form the basis for new stars perhaps. So you get this kind of recycling activity going on in, in the galaxy there. Now if we, if we zoom in even further, so this is, a, this is looking at the galactic centre with the highest resolution radio telescope that we have at the moment, which is called Meerkat, uh, uh, which, which is in uh, South Africa. So with this telescope, if you look at the galactic center, again, you see the, um, you see that a lot of the radiation is coming from these bubble structures, from dead uh, supernovas, you know, from the ghosts of uh, dead stars there. And the very center, the extreme center of the galaxy where we, we have very good reason to believe there's a supermassive black hole living in there. But we can't actually see it with radio because there's too much radiation. <clears throat> there's, too much, there's so much gas accumulated around that central area and it's all radiating in the, in the wavelengths that we're looking at that we can't actually see any real structure in there. And we can't get a very good view of what's going on right in the galactic centre. However, we've we've got these other things. We've got these little streamers and um, these little streamers and filaments that are poking off, poking up out of the galactic plane, poking off into space up here. You see, and uh, nobody knows what those are, what they are. So again, ideas are cheap. There's plenty of people who've come up with ideas about what they might be, but nothing. Nobody's come up with an idea yet that's actually been backed up by observational evidence to um, to support that. So I, I mentioned before the optical telescopes have been around for hundreds of years and people have been collecting telescope images since the 1600s. Well radio, teles radio telescopes have really only, really only got invented after the Second World War and um, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of work done during the war on um, uh, radar and radio communications. <clears throat> and so understanding radio really happened in the 1940s and uh, in the 1950s people started uh, dis people began to discover that there were radio s radio signals actually coming from outer space um, that weren't generated on earth here and it's really only been in the last um, 60 years or so that we've progressed on to develop today's big radio telescopes and we're making new discoveries so what are these what are these strange radio emitting filaments that are coming up from the galactic centre. We don't know. Um, nobody knows what they are. We've never even seen them before. And it's a new discovery that's been made using technology that's really only been invented in the last um, in the last hundred years. So so we're kind of at the forefront of science here. And this is uh, you know, the question these questions we're asking are based on observations that have been made using leading edge technology using the, using the highest resolution radio telescope in the world. So there you are. I've, talked, I've spoken to you a little bit about astronomy. Um, I've shown you some of the strange things we can do with radio telescopes that, you, that are adding to our knowledge that we couldn't get with optical telescopes. <clears throat> now, now I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the technology, about the machines. And uh, let's talk about radio telescopes. And um, this is a picture here of um, a slightly old-fashioned design. It's one of the, one of the early designs of radio telescope is the single dish right the the big dish radio telescope and um, this this is like a curved area and it's it's similar really to the mirror of a an optical telescope that you might have in your in your backyard or maybe down at the Perth observatory if you've been down there you would have seen some of the tele some of the mirror some of the bigger telescopes with a mirror at the bottom curved like this so 
So the idea here is that the radiation comes down from outer space, bounces off this metal uh, dish here, and it's focused into this, the receiver at the centre. So in the centre of the dish there, there's a receiver that collects the radio radiation, then it can be converted into voltages in a wire, taken away and then analysed like that. Now this particular dish is in China and it's the it's the world's largest single dish telescope. Um, so the Chinese don't didn't they, they have a lot of money and they decided that they would have, they wanted to have the world's biggest telescope. So so they built this this one here. And it's only it's only about ten or twelve meters bigger than the previous largest previous largest one, but it is the biggest telescope in the world. And it's five hundred meters across from one side to the other. So it's hard luck for the uh, villagers that used to live in this valley under here, see, because the the telescope, as you can see, is supported by on cables by uh, connected to several different mountains surrounding this valley. So the people who lived in there were basically told to you know, get lost. Uh, we're going to build this big science experiment here, and um, it's now it's now starting to produce results. Um, you know, at the forefront of science, we're seeing papers published using data from FAST, from this um, 500 meter aperture telescope. But one of the problems with this, as you might notice, if you, if you think about it, it can only see the part of the sky that's directly above. So it's looking at one kind of spot above it, above where the telescope is located in the sky. And as the, as the Earth rotates, it uh, makes a track across the across the sky you know in one sort of line so so during during the course of 24 hours it kind of draws out one line in the sky and then uh because the earth is tilted on its axis the next day it does another loop around the around the sky but it's in a slightly different position so so over the course of a over the course of a year it can map out a band of um the sky but basically, you can't, it's, you can't really point it to go and look at um, any particular target of interest. You know, that's, one of, that's one of the problems with these big um, single-dish telescopes. Um, what, it do, the other thing, what it does illustrate, though, is that why did they build it big? Well, the reason they built it big is because bigger means better resolution. So resolution is the ability to see fine details. So... If you remember when you when you go down to the opticians and they hold up that card there, you know, with the big writing at the top and it gets progressively smaller and smaller. So if you've got good resolution, you can see the you can read the rudest fine writing down at the bottom and you can see the tiny, tiny features um, in the sky with the telescope. So that's the reason you go bigger, but there's a practical size limit to how big you can make a telescope. So now we'll move on to um, this. This, which is a much more modern, much more modern concept, and most most radio telescopes nowadays follow this kind of design, which is the interferometer. And this is a this is a picture of a part of a dish interferometer called ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. And it's in WA at the, the, the Murchison Observatory. And the idea here is you have uh, dishes. Obviously, they're a lot smaller than that one in China, but we have lots of them. So the ASCAP has got 36 dishes, and they're they're spread out throughout the desert. And I think the um, the distance between the outer limit lying ones is maybe about four kilometres, I, I believe, something like that. So you can actually get you can actually get a high resolution, even though the dishes are quite small. So the 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 trick here is you've got you is to combine. It, is that the dishes are connect, connected together electronically and you can combine the signals from the different dishes together um, and it, you get the same resolution as if you had one one large dish. The other thing is they can they can be steered, they're, they're steerable so you can point the dish up at a particular target in the sky and you can track it as the earth rotates you can track your target across the sky for nearly for nearly 12 hours before it sets above the, below the horizon so you can actually make um, measurements from very faint sources because you can you can keep staring at them for 12 hours at a time now i'll just give you one example so this is is a nice idea but it's uh, technically quite demanding and it re requires um 
a much higher level of technology than what we'd see perhaps in that Chinese telescope that I showed you before. So, for example, to get the dishes to coordinate their signals so they can all be added together, they must all know the time very, very accurately. So you need a way of sending the time, say from, you might have an atomic clock sitting there at the central spot in the observatory, you've got to be able to transmit time signals out to these, all these dishes, um, so that they can be coordinated, you know, to within millionths of a second, because that's the sort of accuracy you need to be able to combine their signals and get, and, and get images. So, so there so having an interferometer has its own technical problems, and uh, it's it's a higher tech, more modern type of solution. Now I'll move on now to the third and the, the, last, the third and final uh, type of radio telescope, which is this is a, the latest and more modern design again, which is called a dipole interferometer. And what you have here is um, a tile. So this is my supervisor, Stephen, Professor Stephen Tingay. Um, posing here in the middle of one of the tiles. Um, if, if you look over in the background, you can see other tiles. I think there's one, maybe two, two other tiles there in, in, in view. And these tiles are spread around the desert again, um, across multiple locations and you know, covering, a, covering a distance of about three kilometers. Each tile has on it um, individual antennas. These, these, we call them dipoles, but they're, they're in individual antennas and they're kind of the distant relation of the um, TV antenna that you might have had on your roof uh, back back in the days before the uh, NBN came along. You know they used to broadcast TV through the through the atmosphere. You'd have a, you'd have an antenna up there. It's got a mirror at the back and a, a, a spike pointing out with little little crossbars on it. So this is this is something similar. And uh, the metal grid underneath that's the mirror. You know. And you've got the spikes here, and you've got kind of got crosswires. Different design because it's designed to be, um, it's designed to respond to a very very wide range of frequencies. So it's not quite the same as your radio tons, as your um, <laughs> sorry TV antenna, but it's kind of distant relation to it. And again, these these this has the advantage that there's no moving parts, right? So um, what's going on here is that the uh, the dipoles, well, let me explain it this way. If a signal's coming down from outer space, down here, it's going to hit that dipole ever so slightly before it hits that dipole. But yeah, because, because, the speed of light, because the speed of light is finite, there's going to be a very small time delay between impacting the different antennas. And that time delay is going to depend on where in the sky the signals come from. So by carefully analysing that time delay and being, being able to measure it with very high accuracy, very high precision, um, you can actually decide where on the sky you want to look with this particular telescope. So um, you, you can sort of point it, but the pointing isn't, isn't done by moving the um, antennas around. It's purely by electronics adjusting the delay in the, in the radio signals in there. So... There's a lot going on in here, and behind behind this apparent simplicity, in these little boxes in here, is some very high quality uh, electronics that's doing that's doing extremely high precision uh, calculations. That's that's kind of what I'll point out on this. So this is the this is the dipole dipole antenna. Okay, so now I've told you a bit about the um, the hardware. The next step is the supercomputing, because. Uh, an integral part of any radio telescope is the supercomputer. Now, as I've, as I've pointed out to you, these are radio antennas, and they're making they're collecting data from the sky, um, but the, that data needs to be turned into images. And uh, the, da the, the antennas themselves don't produce images, right? They produce a thing that's called the Fourier transform of an image. Now, if you've if you've um, done a degree in physics or something, you might remember what Fourier transforms are. In fact, even if you if you did physics at high school, you might have come across Fourier transforms. If you haven't heard of a Fourier transform, don't worry. Uh, all I'm saying is there's a mathematical computation that has to be done to turn the um, 
radio phase information into actually an image. And then there's a second bunch of um, calculations that have to be done because the images that are produced, they contain uh, shadows that are related to the design of the antenna. So they have that has to be removed as well. So there's a second computation which is called clean clean the image to take away the um, characteristics of the antenna, so you can end up with purely a picture of the sky. So this is a this is a standard thing in radio astronomy. You've got to do the inversion and then cleaning to, to finally get to an actual image of the sky. And I just want to I just want to point out at this stage that this process is very similar. In fact, it's almost identical to the process for making um, images of the subsurface uh, from seismic data. So, so here in Perth we've got lots of people who work on um, mining, uh, oil and gas. They spend millions of dollars collecting seismic data. Um, so seismic data, they basically send sound waves down into the ground and the reflections of the sound waves come back up. And they record them with an array of uh, microphones. So it's actually quite similar to our array of little dipole antennas there, picking the signals up, and the mathematics and the computation you use to turn the turn that data into images is very very similar. So there's a kind of very much a skills um, there's a, there's a connection between seismic processing and radio processing. So people people who work in the oil industry and rock mining industry they. They already know a lot of the computational skills and tricks you need to process radio uh, radio data. So here's a picture of us. This is what a supercomputer looks like. Here's a supercomputer. Uh, this one is uh, this is the one that I use on a daily basis. And these orange things here, individual racks, and inside inside each rack there is a um, what we call a node. So each each one of these machines across there is a separate node. And inside that node, there's a lot of individual computer processors, maybe 48 processors, maybe 68 processors. And they're structured like that. So this, this particular one um, is, a, is in the private sector, and it's mainly used for oil and gas and mining applications. And uh, <coughs> it, it, con it consumes 2 megawatts of electricity when it's running flat out, right? So. But it's just sitting in a it's sitting in a very sort of nondescript looking office building in Kings Park Road up there, just just um, in in uh, West Perth. So I, I like to think that I'm I'm sitting back there in my office and uh, in Curtin University. I go right, send off this big computation job. You know, bam! I like to think that when all the machines all start up, you know, I imagine all the lights dimming in the in the neighbouring office buildings all the way down Kings Park Road. You know, boom! You know. Oh my God! Kemp started up another computation job. So there we go. So that's so I've told you all about the told you a bit about the hardware now about the telescopes um, and the supercomputing that's needed to do <coughs> radio astronomy. Um, and now I was talking to you about the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, and this this really came about from you know that classic thing of a couple of astronomers sitting around um, in a bar <laughs> late at night with a couple of beers, and they said. Wouldn't it be great if we had a telescope that was that had the same resolution as the best um, optical telescope today? So the optical guys, they're great. They've got these great big 10 meter observatories, you know, up in the mountains in Hawaii or in South America and that kind of thing. Um, how are how radar telescopes cut? Nowhere near matching them in resolution. So anyway, so these people they did a quick calculation. They said, "Oh well, if we, for us to get the same resolution as a ten meter optical telescope, we're going to need a radio telescope with a collecting area of one square kilometer, at least." So then they went, sat back and said, "Okay, where are we going to get the money from it for that, and how are we going to how are we going to persuade people to um, to fund it, it gives us the money and let us build it. <clears throat> and this is basically a journey that's been going on for decades, and uh, predominantly led, I have to say, by a man called uh, Peter Quinn, who is uh, he's, he's had a, a wide ranging academic career in many different countries, but he currently works here in Perth, and he was the the first director of ICRA. So Peter Quinn was 
in many, many ways a driving force behind um, a lot of this work in getting persuading people that it needed to be done it was a good idea and that you know talking to politicians and governments and telling them you should get behind this you know it's a great thing and so it has progressed right the way through to today where we we, we actually have a collaboration of um, nine national governments they've got a um a large enough budget to start the construction and there's expectation that other governments quite soon are going to join in and throw more money into the kitty so they'll be able to afford to build out the, the initial vision of the, of the SKA. Um, construction has already started so this year they've actually been out, been out there with um, trucks doing earth moving and uh, you know, working out where they're going to position the antennas and start ma people started manufacturing the the gear and the radio, um, the high quality electronics and so forth that are required for the radio telescopes. And what we're what we're getting here is um, two telescopes. So when when this when this SKA process was underway, they held a competition um, as to which country was best positioned to host. The SKA. So, did they have a good location that was radio quiet, and did they have enough body of uh, you know, people with skills in mathematics and electronics, and computing to be able to support the thing, right? And this 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 competition came down to two countries, which was Western Australia and South Africa. So, in the end, they did the classic bureaucratic thing and uh, split the project between the two. Um, between the two shortlisted <laughs> winners, so um, so we're getting two separate observatory, two two separate telescopes, the mid frequency one, which is the dishes. So the dish based telescope is going to be built in South Africa, and the low frequency telescope, which is the dipoles, uh, that's being built in Western Australia. Now I think I mentioned before that we have ASCAP with thirty six dishes. Well, the SK is going to have one hundred ninety seven uh, dishes. And I don't think I mentioned how many uh, dipoles. I think we've got 256, um, uh, what do you call it, tiles, tiles on our current experimental S uh, MWA telescope. But the full, the full SKA, as we're calling it, is going to have 130,000, 130,000 dipoles. And the construction has already started this year. Um, it's going to take about 10 years to fully build out this infrastructure um, but about two years from now what they've built will be bigger than our current best telescopes so around about two years from now we will start using it to collect data and, and do leading edge leading edge science so cutting edge science uh, with it for two years and the capabilities will continue to improve over the 10 years and I've no doubt that um, somewhere along there someone's going to come along with a, a design for phase two an expansion of the SK and that we wanted to make the next version. Now the Australian component of the SK is being built in the uh, in the Murchison which is up here in the Pilbara um, inland from Shark Bay um, during the actual construction, most of the um, facilities, I mean, you're, you're familiar with the mining, mining projects of the Pilbara, they always have a mining camp, you know, where they, where they run the logistics and the stuff out of there. So, so our, our, our camp is in basically Geraldton, so, so the SKA guys have got a head office in Geraldton to run the construction project out there. Uh, the, main, the main reason for picking this area is it's radio quiet. So there isn't very much radio radiation from um, mobile phones, from microwave cookers, you know, people starting up their car um, ignition, that kind of stuff. So, so there's very little radio radiation up there. So it's a very radio quiet area. And that's the main um, reason why this area was chosen. Um, plus, of course, it's proximity to Perth where we can build up the skills and the knowledge uh, base and have enough enough qualified people nearby to actually operate the thing. Um, there's been a lot of work done with the local Aboriginal uh, community, the traditional owners, um, the Wajiri Yamaji people in the area have been very involved with the SKA. And they've um, helped 
um, they've worked with they've worked with the project team and helped them um, locate where the antennas are going to go and to um, make sure that it's um, compatible with their cultural knowledge of the area. So that, and, and and obviously obviously avoiding any kind of conflict with um, areas which are impo- which are culturally important uh, where they don't want us to get involved. And perhaps that's sort of in contrast a little bit. Some of the mining companies that operate up there don't have necessarily a very good relationship with the um, with the traditional owners. Um, moving right along, this is a artist's impression of the dish telescope that's going to be built that is being built in South Africa, in the Karoo uh, desert area. If you're familiar with the area, <clears throat> so these dishes. Are from, from this photograph, it kind of looks like they're spread sort of at random throughout the desert. But if you look at it directly down from above, you'll see that they're laid out in very carefully calculated spiral shapes so that um, we can maximise the performance of the telescope um, that way. And this, this, is, this is not an artist's impression. This is a photograph of a test pad that's been built for the SKA Low, which is the... West Australian Dipole Telescope. And the, you'll notice here they're using a slightly different design of um, antenna. So the one I showed you before had those little M-shaped um, spider-shaped antennas, but for the SK, went all the way along over the last few years, we've, we've been experimenting with different designs and how to get the most out of the equipment. And the one that's been selected right now for, to go ahead for the SK is this kind of telescope here, so this kind of antenna, and I don't know why. For some reason, they call them uh, they call them Christmas trees. For some reason, I'm not exactly sure why they're called Christmas trees, but they are. There's going to be one hundred and thirty-one thousand of them built and laid out in the desert over the next few years. Now, onto the next, uh, the last, the, the third major component of the top, of the observatory, which is the data processing. So the I've got some facts and figures here for you. So the DISH telescope, which is going up in South Africa there, is going to be producing data 20 terabytes per second. Now it's quite possible you don't even know what a terabyte is, maybe you've got an idea what that means. It's 20,000 gigabytes. So one one gigabyte is probably um, maybe 100 Photographs. So if someone sends you a photograph from the mobile phone, you know, one of those photos that may be maybe 10 megs. So you've kind of got um, a thousand, <laughs> one gigabyte is probably 100 pictures, right? So, so, so this, this one is producing 20,000 gigabytes every second. The uh, dipole, the dipole telescope <coughs> in Western Australia, when it's fully built out, is going to be producing two petabytes per second. Um, again, I don't know, you probably don't know what that means. I mean, for us, a petabyte, that's the sort of thing a, that's the sort of thing us geeks would put on a t-shirt. You know, we write we'd put a t-shirt saying, you know, I, I collect two petabytes of data, you know, and um, really impress other geeky people because it's such a huge number. And that, uh, so this two petabytes is about two million gigabytes per second. Now, um, of course, I'm getting blank looks. Nobody knows what those. Nobody can really comprehend what these numbers mean. Um, so I've, I went and did something for comparison here, and in 2020, um, it's estimated that the total flow of da- data on the internet, the entire internet, including uh, Australia, America, Europe, Japan, China, the entire internet, globally. The f- total flow of data in 2020 was about 95,000 gigabytes per second. So our our telescope that we're building in WA is about 20 times that size. It's about 20 times that size. So the the data coming off the dipole telescope in Western Australia is 20 times the size of the entire internet. So it might give you some flavour of what's, what 
the enormity of what we're building here is gigantic. Now, how are we going to process that data? So we, um, obviously we need a supercomputer that can deal with that amount of data and do that inversion and cleaning that I spoke about, turn it into images and things that we can actually do some science with. So right here in Perth, we've got um, we've got this computer called Setonix. It already <coughs> it was already in existence. Um, it's been around for a few years, uh, but last year it was upgraded uh, to Setonix Phase Two, and it's going to be powered at fifty petaflops. Fifty petaflops. And again, I don't, I don't expect you um, to know or to really appreciate the significance of that number. I mean, it's the kind of thing. You know, I talked earlier about geeks with t-shirts. You know, it's the sort of thing I would get printed on a t-shirt. You know, I've got fifty petaflops. You know, and they're just you're, to, you're out there totally to impress um, other <laughs> other sort of computing people around the world. They go, Nobody's got fifty petaflops. It's crazy. It's insane. And but just to, to but to put it into perspective for you, this this makes um, Satonix in, in Perth today. This makes it the fifteenth largest supercomputer in the world. So you think of all the machines in the USA, in Japan, in China, they're, they're out there being used for military purposes, they're being used for climate modelling, they're being used for modelling disease, you know, for disease control, as well as astronomy, and they're being used for geology to do exploration for oil and gas. So out of all that whole population, the 15th largest supercomputer in the world is here today uh, in at the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre over at Technology Park in near Kern University. In fact, it's just across the road from um, the Collier Golf Course. So, if you ever find yourself over towards that golf course, there you can on your way back. You can just take your car for a bit of a spin around Technology Park. There, you can drive drive around um, the Pawsey Centre and have a look at it. You can't see the computer from the street, but you know, have a look at the outside of the building. So here's a picture of the super supercomputer itself. Uh, not much to see, you know, unlike the one I showed you before. It's in all the racks are inside these cabinets here. The cabinets are all locked up. Um, what it does have is this rather lovely artwork that was done out the back here, and this was done, um, I believe, with um, this was this was designed and painted by. Um, one of the Aboriginal elders, I don't know if they're from the, um, the Amatji people up north, whether they're from the Noongar people in Perth, but um, it's one of, one, of the, one of the Aboriginal groups uh, really got involved in this. They're really interested in what's going on with this new technology being built on the ancient uh, lands you know, that have been, that have been so productive for the Aboriginal people over thousands of years. And just out of curiosity, uh, I'm not sure if anybody in here in the audience knows uh, what this actually means, Satonics, what it actually means. It's actually the um, Latin uh, name for the species, for the, for the corker, right? So, so Satonics named after the corker. Isn't that nice? Now that computer I showed you before that belonged to the private sector that's being used for oil and gas, that computer had a name as well. Uh, it's called Bruce. So it just tells you something about the culture, you know, the culture that's going on, <clears throat> the cultural differences between the private sector and the government sector. So now I now want to go on and talk about employment and technology in Western Australia. So um, I've already told you I work at ICRA, and this was a this was a research institute that was set up specifically to support the SKA bid. And now that we've won the bid, or we've won half the bid, we're going to continue, of course, as a research institute. Uh, working with the data from the telescope. <clears throat> ICRA has uh, 200 researchers and engineers, and it's, it's about 100 in Curtin and about 100 at UWA. And you know, if, you go back, if you go back 10 years ago, that would have been probably 10 people. You know? So it's, it's a growth area. You know? so this, the, all these research people have come from um, around the world or they've come from other industries, and they're all gathering here. As a, as a centre of excellence. Um, CSIRO, our national research organisation, they have a division of space and astronomy. Most of their people are over on the east coast running the existing radio telescopes over there, but they've already got a group of about 50 people um, here in Perth in Technology Park. And they're, they're, um, 
you know, intentionally to work with SKA and to develop more um, develop more science around that. The SKA Observatory itself is only just getting going. So they, they've got an office here in Perth, but they've only got about 10 people. So and that will obviously grow. Um, so when, when the when the telescope goes into operations um, in in a couple of years, they're probably gonna need about 50 people or more or more kind of to operate the telescope. But at the moment it's still only just started construction, so they've only got a few uh, like you know, senior managers and planners and people here. Um, the Pawsey Computing Centre, I, I don't know how many people they employ actually, it's a bit of a mystery. They've got this, they've got this very nice looking building out there, but they, it's very hard to get in. I've, I've never actually been in there, so I've never seen the, I've never seen the <laughs> setup they've got inside. And I don't know how many people they employ, but um, that's another centre. So, you know, we prob we've probably got, probably got 500 people just working in astronomy um, in WA that have been brought here because of the SKA. Um, during the construction over the next 10 years, obviously there's going to be lots of jobs um, in Perth and Geraldton, you know, and the, these, are, these are not necessarily the PhD qualified scientists. I mean, we've got people um, all over, you know, doing the sort, sort of people that be employed in a mining, uh, a new, setting up a new mining project, you know, doing earthworks, doing logistics, moving material around, um, they've all got to be fed. So, you know, you've got people running the canteens, you've got accommodation. And the, the technology for the SKA is already driving commercial success in Perth. And this is the kind of thing which the West Australian government is very keen to see. This is really why they were keen to invest in the project in the first place. And I'll, I'll just talk about one specific example. And there, there are many examples, I'll just give you one. So you may remember I spoke about the DISH telescopes and the need to send them all accurate timing signals, right? So that was that's a problem. When you come to the SKA, where the dishes are much further apart than we've ever had on any other radio telescope before, we need a way of communicating the time signals out to those remote dishes. And uh, obviously you can't use radio and... Um, Traditionally, it would be done with fiber, fiber optics, but they don't want to lay long fiber optic cables out through the desert going out to all these dishes. You know, you can imagine that some some lizard would come along and you bite through the cable. Now you've got to send someone out to the desert, got to go up there, look for the break, repair it. You know, not, not very good. So the team, the team that were charged with finding a new technology uh, in a team in UWA probably started off as only about four or five people initially. They were given some money to come up with a new solution. <clears throat> so with the money they hired in some research staff, they worked intensively for a few years. <coughs> Excuse me. And they've come up with a solution that's based around free space lasers, which is basically a laser beam just from a central location going out and transmitting data to each of those dishes in turn. Now it sounds simple, sounds obvious, but it's actually very difficult because um, air currents and changes in humidity uh, bend the light signals. So they, they make the laser lights sort of twinkle and move around. So they've got a solution there. I think, I think it involves multiple laser beams. So you use one to measure the twinkling and then you have some extremely fast electronics that updates the direction finding on the second laser, you know, so something like that. So they come with the, anyway, they come up with a solution whereby they can send data through through the air to um, a distant location um, reliably and to transmit information. Now as soon as they've done that and they've published it, <coughs> they've been inundated with uh, inquiries from all around the world because lots of people are interested in using that technology for other applications. So, for example, the shipping company, um, they want to be able to send out messages to uh, container ships. So you've got navies that want to send out, they want to be able to communicate in a secure manner to um, warships out across the ocean, um, even communication with satellites. So we've got people who want to talk to um, low Earth orbit satellites, 100 kilometres up, up uh, in orbit, um, 
with a with a with a um, with a laser, you can send a lot more information per second than you can with a radio signal. So they're saying, well, if only we could point the radio signals reliably and stay on the target, we could we could use that to communicate with the satellites. So all these people are coming to um, coming to the people in Perth and asking, can we use your technology? <laughs> and so obviously licensing, you know, obviously it can be it can be licensed and the money. The, you know, the intellectual property belongs to um, one of the institutions in West Australia and any money from licensing is going to come into our economy here and uh, the, you know, the state government sees a big payback in terms of economic benefits to the state from that kind of work. So uh, that's one example. There are many, there are many others um, that I'm aware of and probably many more others that I'm not aware of going on in Perth right at the moment where... Um, the fact that we've got these um, uh, high technology industry, all the people there to support it, and they're de they're inventing stuff which has spin-offs. Um, you know that's that's really where the state government can see um, some of the future prosperity of the state coming from coming from there. This I think this is on my last slide. Um, uh, it's kind of complements the last one really. Um, the SK is not just about astronomy, and not just about telescope. We're building a skills conveyor belt, you know, which is going to operate for the next ten years and off into the future when they build the second phase of the SKA and so forth. So everything from PhD qualified scientists, you know, um, TAFE qualified uh, engineers, computer scientists, uh, data scientists, all the support staff, you know, project managers, contract managers accountants, communications and PR people, education, artists and writers, you know, people who can take the um, results, the, re the science results, and turn them into um, images and stories that uh, can easily be used to educate the, the public who are not necessarily scientifically uh, very literate. Um, all those areas, jobs are being created, and um, we don't expect just to <clears throat> recruit everyone from out of university and have them sitting in this sitting in this uh, astronomy space. We fully expect interchange within other industries. So it could be that um, somebody can um, study science at university. They can move into astronomy. Maybe four or five years at ICRA, they can become an expert on the processing of radio telescope data. And then with that knowledge, perhaps they can leave and go and get a job in the oil and gas industry um, on processing seismic data because it's such a similar process. <clears throat> so they can go off and have another career. Or conversely, you can have people who worked in the oil industry, people like myself, who have a bit of a background knowledge of um, seismic data and project management. They can, you know, when the time's right for them, they can quit the oil industry and come and work in astronomy. Um, also, we get people coming from overseas constantly. So um, we'll have visitors we'll have visitors from other countries. They'll come to Perth, work for maybe three months or maybe six months. Um, they learn a lot while they're here from working with our ICRA people. They've also developed something new. The thing they developed stays here. They go back to their um, they go back to their home institution skilled up and uh, full, filled up with new knowledge um, and singing the praises of Western Australia as being the centre for um, expertise in all the technologies that go around um, radio, radio astronomy. That's, a, that's our vision and that's, that's kind of what I see happening now. Um, <clears throat> you know, I see examples of that happening uh, already and it can only get better over the next um, 10 years. So Western Australia... In terms of radio astronomy, West Australia is going to be radioactive for decades to come. That's the that's my um, that's my punchline. That's my little joke there. Uh, but at this stage, I'm ready to take uh, questions. So I might I might just have a suggestion though, because I know with a group like this, um, when people meet an astronomer, they they there's a standard sort of list of questions people like to come out with. You know, <laughs> related to the uh, how old is the universe and tell me about the aliens and all this kind of stuff. So maybe we can leave those questions to last and we'll start off with questions about the about the subject of the talk, you know, about the SKA and about industry in, in WA. And then 
after we've exhausted that, I'm quite happy to answer any other questions you have more broadly about um, about astronomy, cosmology, and the universe, etc. So, um, ready for it. Over to you. <laughs>